Hi. Hello. We're in John Wesley Brady. This freedom whence? He's in the chapter Blind Guides now, and specifically dealing with the, the the poor example of most of the archbishops of Canterbury during this period of the early 18th century. He's been talking about Cornwallis, a famous name if you know anything about the American Revolution, but Cornwallis is one of the names that was uh, among the uh, British uh, leaders, generals, who were leading the the suppression of the revolutionaries. But another Cornwallis, Frederick, was was maneuvering his way up to the Archbishop position, the Archbishop of Canterbury, nominally the head of the Church of England throughout the world. And here's how he did it. Brady says, in 1765, the bishopric of Salisbury fell vacant. It was a desirable see, that is seat, and Cornwallis was pulling strings to secure it for himself. But when, in 1766, the king announced appointments, Salisbury was given to another, although Cornwallis was granted the deanery of St. Paul's. Newcastle wrote congratulations to Cornwallis, who, answering, expressed unbridled rancor that the former had not sufficiently pulled, that is Newcastle, had not sufficiently pulled political and ecclesiastical ropes in his favor. And Cornwallis writes this way, quote, you say you are much rejoiced at my having accepted the deanery of St. Paul's. For what reason, I know not. As for myself, I have no joy in it. I am not fond of expedience. Had the recommendation to it come from your grace by way of atonement, I should have rejected the deanery. After the hard treatment I had met with, I could not with honor have accepted it. It is by no means a preferment either agreeable or suitable to me. It would have been kind of your grace not to have kept me so long in suspense with regard to the bishopric of Salisbury. Had you told me it was a real promise, it would at least have mitigated the severity of the disappointment. You say it is, on, it is the only instance, and the manuscript is here underlined, but several years ago you gave Worcester to the Bishop of Gloucester. Surely, my lord, you, the, the disregard then showed to me may be allowed to have given just cause of some dissatisfaction, not only to me, but to my family and friends. It certainly did. You begged forgiveness. It was immediately granted, and the hardship forgotten. The late unfortunate circumstance brought it back to my mind. <laughs> <laughs> not completely forgotten. <laughs> From here, Brady says, the tone of the letter changes and the fawning spirit, ever angling for future preferments, is exhibited to its close. <coughs> Cornwallis married a great lady, prominent in the highest social life. He made himself a conspicuous character at court, and on the first vacancy following the writing of these letters, was appointed primate of England. Soon, however, Lambeth Palace was the scene of such notorious routs and feastings that Lady Huntington, after an ineffectual appeal to Cornwallis and his lady, lodged a protest with the king and queen. The result was that George III, on investigation, wrote to the Cornwallises in no uncertain terms. Quote, my good lord prelate, I would not delay giving you notification of the grief and concern with which my breast was affected at receiving authentic information that routes had made their way into your palace. And routes are the equivalent of a, a wild party, well, I guess. We would call a wild party, yeah. Right. At the same time, I must signify to you my sentiments on the subject which hold these levities and vain dissipations as utterly inexpedient, if not unlawful, to pass in a residence for many years devoted to divine studies, religious retirement, and extensive exercise of charity and benevolence. From the dissatisfaction with which you must perceive I behold these improprieties, not to speak in harder terms, and on still more pious principles, I trust you will suppress them immediately, so that I may not have occasion 
to show any further marks of my displeasure or to interpose in a different manner. May God take your grace into his almighty protection. I remain, my Lord Primate, your gracious friend, G.R. G.R. stands for, we imagine, George Rex, the Latin for King George. You have to admire his elegance of writing. Eh? The, the king knew how to write. <laughs> and all these guys know how to talk. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. The, but it's their behavior that seems to be the problem. Then Brady goes on to talk about the, net, the next Archbishop, Moore, who was even more crassly self-seeking than Cornwallis, having married as his second wife a sister of Lord Auckland and now commanding influence in high places. He begins to reckon on the material advantages of a bishopric as compared with certain preferments already in his grasp, some of which might have to be dropped. He says, how much already in possession must be given up? There are bishoprics and bishoprics, small, middling, and pretty good. What is the net gain of such a change? End of quote. Writing to his influential brother-in-law in 1772, when climbing rapidly the social ladder, he says, quote, Lord North must understand I will not be a bishop unless he contrives that I live with some degree of comfort. I mean, with such an income as may enable me to support my station, end of quote. Yeah. Again, in 1775, he writes to Lord Auckland in words which recall Cornwallis's correspondence with Newcastle. Quote, it is thought the Bishop of Rochester can last but a very short time. If the new Duke of Barbara will move on this occasion, it will at least bring me forward, end of quote. On another occasion, with unconscious irony, he writes, quote, The more I know of the world, the less I expect of personal satisfaction in entering into the bustle of it. End of quote. Mm, that's the problem. They want to be in the bustle of it. Okay. On April 26, 1783, the very day of his appointment as primate and 14 days before he was enthroned, at Canterbury, we find more corresponding regarding high preferment for his brother-in-law. And on April 28, 12 days before he was actually installed as head of the church, he writes, quote, In the meantime, should Dr. Stilton, Stinton drop, and he means drop dead, his preferment in the gift of the archbishop will I fear be in hazard? What interest my feelings is, no, what interests my feelings is that the preferment would at once reach the utmost wishes of my sister-in-law, my sister's husband, J. Cantor, end of quote. Very self-seeking people. Having shown such solicitude for his sister's husband, it is not surprising that Moore used his authority as primate to secure well-feathered nests for his five sons, three of whom he made joint registrars of the prerogative court of Canterbury, and the other two joint registrars of the vicar general's office. One of these sons, for more than 50 years, was the recipient of an average annual income from the church not less than 12,000 pounds. Moore's own Archie Episcopal revenue averaged eleven thousand pounds a year, the equivalent of some twenty five thousand today, and that's more like a quarter of a million pounds in two thousand and twenty. It is a sorry commentary on the church's government that each of these preferment hunters received from the ecclesiastical treasury more than a thousand times the customary stipend of the self sacrificing missionary teacher who, taking his life in his hands, went as a servant of Christ to minister to the Indians in the wilds of America. Mm. And that's the, the, the counterbalance to what we're reading here. Is that yeah. If we're witnesses, we don't realize mm. that even mm. while all this corruption was happening at the top. Yeah, which is where corruption usually hap happens. Missionaries were already going out. Both yeah. Roman Catholic and Protestant missionaries were going to the wilds of the world, including, of course, North America. So there's always some very self-serving uh, self people 
at the top mm -hmm. usually, and then there's also very sacrificial people in the church. And and even at this very time, in the late, in this case, these two uh, archbishops, the late 18th century, during the American Revolution and the Napoleonic era, you had the Wesleys in in full throttle. They, John had just died, but mm -hmm. 50 years of his influence on the church had left the legacy that William Wilberforce would pick up the baton mm -hmm. and, and, and drive even further into the conscience of England, i.e. What is the Christian position about slavery and about social wrongs mm -hmm. even in England? And, and missionaries being sent out, right? And missionaries were going forth. William Carey in the first great missions and Henry Martin after him. All this happening at the same time mm -hmm. around Napoleon's time. Mm -hmm. so, so we don't know that when we're witnesses, that God was doing a great work even if the corruption that we have heard about was real. This was evidence that God was always at work. Yeah. And we should expect to see corruption and and purity, like people who are really making every effort to live selfless lives. Naboth, and I'm reminded of the Naboth story in the Old Testament that mm -hmm. there's corruption in its essence that Jezebel, who is not even an Israelite, Mm -hmm. is is bringing uh, an even deeper level of corruption to the already corrupt northern kingdom but mm -hmm. but while all of this is happening and and the king and the queen are stealing someone's inheritance Naboth mm -hmm. Elijah is being raised up by God to deal with it and then after he goes Elisha also being sent to that same corrupt northern kingdom right. God is always at work mm -hmm. so I'll put that link to a Walter Brueggemann's discussion of Naboth and the theft of his inheritance by King Ahab.